Welcome all to the keynote session for the Library Sustained Track of our World Library and Information Congress 2021. Libraries, of course, have always operated with an eye to the future. The work that the colleagues of the past have carried out to preserve, safeguard the memory of the world is why we are able to benefit from so much of the historical record as we do. This work continues. This welcome new understanding of how our choices and practices in preservation can best ensure that those who come after us have the fullest picture of who we are today. Sustainability is, a, is about just this, ensuring that the choices we make now leave the best possible world for those who come next. And libraries can do this not only through preservation, but also in so many other ways. Indeed, our institutions have become increasingly engaged in wider efforts to promote economically, socially, and of course, environmentally sustainable development. Through our collections, through the spaces we offer, through the skills of our profession, we have a unique contribution to make. Climate change is, of course, the defining long-term threat to sustainability. The message of the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change last week, highlighting that we are in a cold and cold red situation, only reaffirmed the urgency of actions. And so I'm very glad to welcome Andrew Potts, founder of the Climate Heritage Network, as a keynote speaker here today. Andrew is a heritage lawyer by background but also been highly active in promoting policy change, both to support heritage and to release its potential at the national and global levels, as well as founding the Climate Heritage Network. He coordinates the Climate Change and Heritage Working Group at the International Council on Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS, and has previously served as ICOMOS focal point on the SDGs. Thank you, Andrew, for joining us here. The floor is yours. Well, th thank you, Gerald, for that very generous introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be with you and with so many IFLA friends and colleagues today for this important conference. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Andrew Potts and I'm the coordinator of the Secretariat for the Climate Heritage Network. We call it the CHN. The CHN was launched in 2019 with the goal of foregrounding the cultural dimensions of climate change, scaling up culture-based solutions to climate change, and mobilizing arts, culture, and heritage for climate action. The CHN, it's a diverse group comprised of government, cultural organizations, businesses, universities, civil society. We have a number of libraries, archives, and other documentary heritage institutions as members. And I'd be remiss if I didn't invite each of your institutions to consider joining us as well. It's free and easy to join. It's done entirely online at climateheritage.org. And here I would also specifically like to thank and congratulate IFLA because IFLA was one of the founding members of the Climate Heritage Network and IFLA has consistently worked to sound the alarm for the need for climate action. And to be honest, the need for climate action has never been greater. I usually begin my talks with some words aimed at underscoring the urgency of the climate emergency, but no words I could write could do a better job than those contained in the report that Gerald just referred to, the report that was approved last week by the 195 governments that make up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which is the world's leading climate science body. That report, entitled Climate Change 2021, The Physical Science Basis, says that climate scientists are observing changes in the Earth's climate in every region across the world and in every climate system, that many of the changes observed in the climate are unprecedented in thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, and that some of the changes already set in motion, such as sea level rise, are irreversible over hundreds of years. The report also found, however, that some of the worst impacts of climate change can still be avoided, but doing so will require deep, rapid cuts in greenhouse gas emissions, which of course are the causes of anthropogenic climate change. Specifically, the IPCC has reported that while 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming over pre-industrial levels 
will severely damage human and natural systems, including natural and cultural heritage, the impacts of two degrees of warming will be significantly worse. So I, I just wanna reiterate that point, uh, which comes out so clearly from the IPCC report of the importance of working to try to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels. So what does that mean? I mean, that's a quite uh, um, diffuse observation. What does that mean for us, for this audience? Uh, first, uh, I just, a takeaway I want you to have is that at scale, efforts to mitigate the impacts of climate change have to include aiding and in reducing greenhouse gas emissions or so-called decarbonization. So of course, we in cultural heritage, we have to prioritize work to enhance the resilience of our institutions, to protect our collections, to safeguard the documentary heritage that we care for. But simply put, in many places, those communities will not be able to adapt their way out of the impacts of two degrees of warming. The impacts are too great and every, adapt, every system has a limit to its adaptive capacity. And so our work to conserve collections, to safeguard heritage, to aid communities, it has to include an explicit focus on helping communities decarbonize, on helping the world to achieve this goal of holding warming to 1.5 degrees. The second lesson that I wanna underscore from last week's IPCC report is that um, the work to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, um, these pathways um, to reducing our emissions to that level, these are fundamentally cultural journeys. These, the cultural dimensions of this work looms large. Holding warming to 1.5 degrees is going to be incredibly difficult. Indeed, according to the report released last week, we've already warmed the planet 1.1 degrees over uh, pre-industrial levels. So we've been at this industrial revolution thing for a long time. The science tells us that holding warming to 1.5 degrees will require change, transformative change, in the way communities build cities, grow food, travel, all aspects of society will have to change. And these changes are needed rapidly, uh, indeed in this decade, because the window of opportunity to hold warming to 1.5 degrees is closing. And so what I would like to propose to you, what I would like to suggest to you, is that no society, at least no industrialized society, can achieve systems transitions on a nearly unprecedented scale at that speed without attention to the cultural dimensions of these shifts and without capturing the hearts and minds of residents. And so this is where we come in. Cultural heritage, documentary heritage, information, libraries and information science, traditional wisdom and knowledge, all of these offer immense potential to support transformative action and just transitions by communities towards low carbon, climate resilient futures. Climate change is an anthropogenic problem. It means caused by people and anthropogenic problems need human solutions. And what is cultural heritage if not a great accumulation of human experience and solutions? Guiding transformative change requires understanding how humans relate to places and things. It benefits from knowing how humans have responded to past social and environmental change. Address Addressing climate change calls for planning with a multi-generational time horizon, an approach that we in cultural heritage almost uniquely bring in terms of our efforts to safeguard and conserve culture. Addressing climate change demands circular economy approaches that promote the reuse and conservation of resources, and it demands information, creativity, and cultural capital. These are the things we're good at in cultural heritage, and these are the things that are good for climate action. What this means is that there's a climate action mission and a purpose for every cultural heritage actor, for every cultural institution. And so we have a choice in our work, either to be a part of the solution to climate change or not to be. But the scary thing here is that this choice, this choice not to be a part of the solution, it's really easy to make because all it requires is doing things the way we always have done them. It's business as usual that has given us the climate crisis. And so how do we opt out of this business usual approach? The problem is so many cultural institutions, frankly, so many libraries, archives, and museums, many of our colleagues are currently making the choice 
to behave in a business as usual manner. We still have too many government culture agencies, including the ones that manage libraries and archives that aren't involved in climate planning for their cities and regions, too few national climate plans that don't assign any role to culture, too few museums and libraries that aren't messaging about climate change, too few facilities and collections managers who don't know how to downscale a 30 year climate model, I'm sorry, a 30 year climate model and incorporate that into their work and too few traditional knowledge bearers and indigenous scientists invited to the climate science table. So how do we shift this paradigm? What does the other path look like? What does cultural heritage look like when we reject business as usual and orient our work to be a part of the solution to climate change? This is the reason that the Climate Heritage Network was founded. It aims to answer the questions, how do we increase the ambition of arts, culture, and heritage communities and institutions to contribute to the work of addressing climate change? How do we convince others like environmental policymakers and climate scientists of the relevance of culture and heritage to their work? The THN aims to connect culture and heritage to climate science and policy. Its members have committed to calibrating their work to the targets of the Paris Agreement which means working to mitigate future climate change by helping communities reduce their carbon footprint so that we can hold warming to 1.5 degrees. It means building resilience and helping people to adapt to the climate change we've already caused. And importantly, it means planning for loss and damage, including loss to cultural resources because every system has a limit to its adaptive capacity and we're not going to be able to save everything. So how is the Climate Heritage Network doing this? First, we're attempting to build bridges between cultural institutions and cultural operators and the realms of climate science and climate policy. In essence, we're trying to provoke a conversation about culture in the climate world. There's a cultural dimension to every aspect of climate action. And so this is a big conversation. But in 2019, the members of the Climate Heritage Network voted to prioritize a few topics including the role of art, culture, and heritage in adaptation and resilience, the role of culture in supporting decarbonization of buildings and cities, agriculture, and travel, uh, as well as the role of cultural heritage in just transition and gender responsive climate action. So these are a few of the aspects of climate policy that we're particularly trying to focus on. At the same time, while we're trying to provoke a conversation about culture among climate colleagues, we're trying to provoke more conversations about climate change among culture colleagues. To do this, we have eight working groups focused on developing scalable culture-based climate action tools that will help remove barriers to climate action by cultural institutions. These are things like teaching cultural actors how to communicate about climate change, promoting methodologies that value traditional knowledge in contemporary climate planning, mainstreaming culture and heritage into national, regional, local climate action planning, and identifying ways that cultural institutions can support climate action by local communities and indigenous peoples. This work is incorporating a lot of great examples drawn from libraries, archives, and other documentary heritage institutions. Again, I'd like to thank IFLA for their work specifically uh, um, in this um, uh, planning, especially the work on communicating about climate change. Overall, we call this work the Madrid to Glasgow Arts, Culture, and Heritage Climate Action Plan. Why do we call it that? We call it that because we launched this initiative in 2019 at the UN Climate Conference that year held in Madrid, and we aim to deliver the results at the upcoming UN Climate Conference known as COP26, which is scheduled to be held in the first two weeks of November in Glasgow in the UK. COP26 has the potential to be a turning point in the planet's collective work to tackle climate change and the Climate Heritage Network and its members, and I know that includes IFLA, is committing, committed to making sure that cultural solutions and the cultural dimensions to the climate emergency are not overlooked at COP26. And I'd like to invite each of your institutions to join us to make sure your programming on climate change in the run up to COP26 and during COP26 which again is the first two weeks of November in this year. So just to conclude, uh, according to the 2020 UN uh, Environment Agency, UNEP, uh, the admissions gap report that they issued this past December, 
the world is on course for not 1.5 degrees of global warming, not two degrees of global warming, but three degrees of global warming in this century. That result would be catastrophic for people, for communities, for the conservation and safeguarding of culture and heritage. So much work has been done these past decades to try to tackle the climate emergency. And yet here we are with the problem still getting worse. What haven't we tried? Who's been missing from the climate action team so far? I would suggest to you that largely culture and heritage has been missing from the climate heritage team, or at least we haven't been fully included. We haven't been enough at the table. But as I've tried to point out, our skills are useful. We have a lot to contribute. So no more business as usual for cultural institutions. Let us as cultural actors, as libraries, as librarians, as archivists, as conservators, as administrators, as knowledge holders, make holding global warming below 1.5 degrees an explicit goal of our work. Let us insist that cultural actors and cultural institutions are included in climate planning and have a seat at the climate action table. When it comes to tackling the climate emergency, I say count culture and count heritage in. And I think you will agree that that has to be a defining mission of our work in these coming years. And so again, I thank IFLA, I thank you for putting climate change on the agenda. I thank you for your support and your work on these issues and your engagement with the Climate Heritage Network. And I look forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Angel, so much for these insights and ideas. There was so much insight for us already. Uh, I had a few questions to follow up. Of course, most of them are about the involvement of libraries and I want to dig into some of the details you have raised already. My first question, of course, is what do you see the role of libraries collections being in contributing to climate action? You have talked already about libraries, but uh, I think there was nothing about library collections inside. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And uh, I, I noted already that there are, are a lot of libraries, archives, documentary heritage institutions that are engaged in climate action. So we have a lot of good examples. Um, the question is how do we deepen the impact and how do we scale that out to more colleagues? I mean, a few examples that come to mind. First of all, libraries are trusted institutions in communities. And so when libraries communicate about climate change, when they include um, climate change as a priority in their messaging, then that uh, means something to the communities they serve. That makes an impact. And these can be very small things. So for example, uh, I'm aware of libraries that are replacing their traditional light bulbs with LED light bulbs um, to save energy, to save money. Okay, great. But how about putting a little placard next to the light switch in the library that says, we replaced our light bulbs because that saves energy and burning fossil fuels to create energy is what is causing climate change. So that little placard puts the library on record in the community as um, being concerned about anthropogenic climate change. So it's a very small thing, but it helps to um, reinforce to the community the message that trusted institutions are worried about climate change. So that's a small thing, but there are many other uh, types of uh, activities. And you, Gerald, you ask about collections specifically. It's interesting how many institutions hold collections which can yield information about um, the climate crisis, either information about past weather, um, and the way uh, and climatic conditions in prior years, because you'd be surprised at uh, the scarcity of good information about climate conditions in a given place 100 years ago, 200 years ago, more. And information libraries hold can help establish baselines of past climate that aid us in understanding today's climate change. Um, libraries hold information about past responses to, to dramatic change, environmental change, climate change, that can help guide and inform planning for adaptation and resilience today. Um, libraries hold information that can help individual users, citizens, residents, participants understand the climate crisis. Libraries have space that can be used to bring the community together to discuss and message about climate change. And so um, from making, simply making space available 
for climate conversations, to messaging about climate change, to mining the collections of libraries for information useful to climate science and climate planning. I think there's a huge role for these institutions. Wonderful, great ideas, I would say. Uh, you mentioned already COP26. I'm interested, what scope do you see for partnership with governments and other working on climate change, especially in the run-up of the COP26 this year? Yes, um, it's a great question. So we at the Climate Heritage Network have been trying to insert the topic of culture, of art, of heritage into the agenda at COP26. And uh, we've specifically focused on a few areas, especially uh, resilience and adaptation. And so the UN is rolling out this campaign called the Race to Resilience for the first time ever that will have goals from the culture sector in this UN campaign. But um, the CHN alone certainly cannot achieve everything that needs to be achieved um, going in a multilateral way, talking to UN institutions. We need uh, institutions in countries, in communities, to be giving these same messages to their governments and to their climate negotiators. Every country is sending a team to uh, COP26. Uh, many countries have pavilions, they have uh, information campaigns built around uh, the COP. And so if institutions in those countries can build bridges to their um, climate, to their country's climate teams, and entreat, ask, uh, offer to help with those institutions, including cultural dimensions in their work, um, that would be a huge help. Um, simply find out if your country is going to have a pavilion, an information pavilion at COP26 and offer to provide information on how libraries in your country are helping tackle climate change. It's an easy thing that you can do. And then as I noted uh, earlier, also message to your communities, to your users, to your constituents about climate change during that period. There'll be a lot of attention from the media, um, a, a lot of uh, global conversation, social media about climate change at the end of October and in the first two weeks of November. So it's a great time for you to get users' attention and to talk about the issue too. Wonderful. I guess there are a lot of ideas already for us here, which we can follow in the next months. Uh, what I'm interested uh, to hear a bit more uh, following up this idea with COP26, uh, how far do you think we are in ensuring that uh, heritage institutions like libraries are properly engaged in risk mitigation strategies? Ah, well, I think there's a lot of variability. Uh, some institutions are well prepared and others are not. Um, I, I know that um, IFLA and other institutions have spent a lot of time looking at emergency response, hazard mitigation, disaster risk reduction for documentary institutions. So we have a lot to build on, but the threat of climate change is not the same necessarily as the threat from volcanoes or earthquakes. I mean, this is an anthropogenic problem and how bad it gets, how high the seas will rise, how many days of extreme heat we will have, it's variable and it depends on how much climate action we take. And so, as I said at the outset, part of this disaster response work by cultural institutions needs to be focused on helping reduce the climate threat through supporting decarbonization. But even in terms of the immediate climate drivers and hazards like heat and precipitation. Um, I, I think too few institutions are, are focusing on the variability of climate change. They're not downscaling climate models to look at how bad the situation is meant to be in 20 or 30 years. They're re relying only on traditional um, risk preparedness efforts. And so we need institutions to focus more on the unique nature of the climate threat and as they do that, and their knowledge and engagement with climate change issues grows, they will be able to develop adaptation and resilience and hazard mitigation plans that are more tailored to the unfolding threats posed by climate hazards in the coming years. Oh, I fear we are almost out of time here. And so I simply wanted to thank you, not just for your time and perspectives here, but for all that you do to ensure that all parts of the heritage sector are fully integrated in the, into climate action. I guess we got a lot of ideas from you in this uh, short session. And I really look forward to continued engagement of EFLA in the Climate Heritage Network, both in the run-up to COP26 
and beyond. And I'm quite sure it was an inspiring session for our participants. A lot of ideas came in from you and we will continue to work together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gerald.